everyone, welcome back. I'm Steve Stembridge with Amazon Web Services. I am a locally based account manager focused specifically on the ed tech sector. Um, this is our third year uh, to sponsor the ed tech and training day for Twin City Startup Week. We are so proud of that relationship and our involvement. So thank you guys for coming. We want to talk a little bit today around some of the things that we're doing in the education sector generally and ed tech specifically that a lot of people may not know that we have our uh, efforts towards. So with that, I wanted to hand off today to our uh, head of ed tech strategy, Mike Bauer, who will lead us through the next session. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking some time and, and joining us for this session on the EdTech Startup Guide. My name is Mike Bauer. I lead up our EdTech strategy and kind of growth uh, advisory and product for, from the standpoint of Amazon Web Services as a public sector cloud infrastructure provider. But it, that sounds a lot of tech-specific, tech and I'm not here to talk about the specific you know, infrastructure, though we will hit on some services. What I'd like to walk through is kind of what AWS is doing in the education vertical uh, in general. So I'm going to walk through just kind of a, a quick intro. I also, like Steve, live here in the Twin Cities and uh, enjoy working with a lot of local uh, ed tech uh, startups. Amazon Web Services supports thousands of ed techs, right? From all sorts of, from the start, very early stage, pre-seed startups, all the way to very mature um, organizations. Some of the biggest customers that you might know are folks like Blackboard and Lucian, and some of the biggest student information system providers and learning management services uh, out there. My background, I actually came from the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, where I was investing in ed tech and uh, both for-profit, non-profit. I've helped start multiple ed tech organizations uh, while I was there uh, using philanthropic capital. Um, and then prior to that, I worked, I've spent the last 20 years, frankly, in, in ed tech. So this is kind of my, my world. I come from a family of educators. I have four daughters, uh, 12, 10, 9, and 4 years old. And so I'm very invested personally and professionally in sort of where we're going as far as a, a sector in, in the education market segment. Um, so that's just a little bit about, about me. Um, a, a, about a few months ago, we released this EdTech Startup Guide, and, and it was specifically released by a program within uh, Amazon Web Services. Let me, let me actually even back up further. We have a higher education group at Amazon Web Services. We have a K-12 specific group at Amazon Web Services. We have the group that I work in, which is EdTech. And then we also have our publishers. Most of you would know those folks like Pearson and Cengage and McGraw-Hill Education and those who have like physical textbooks, right? And so many of those have moved to digital and e-learning types of, of organizations. And so we service all of those. And total, uh, all in, we have more than 5,000 ed tech organizations that are, are running on AWS. But we're starting to see, like there's, there's a, a new you know, revolution that has taken place in the last year because of the pandemic. And so we're seeing this influx right now of ed tech organizations primarily because of the fundraising that's taking place. There's so much interest in mergers and acquisitions that are taking place, and everybody's coming to the ed tech sector going, hey, I can start something that does something better, cheaper, faster, more optimized uh, than, than what is serving the market today. And that's actually very accurate, but there's still a lot of legacy, uh, what, we, what we would say tech debt that's out there, and there's a lot that, that can be um, uh, uh, moved. So we're gonna go through some, we have seven different ed tech trends we're gonna walk through that have taken place over the last uh, set, uh, over the last year with the, the pandemic. And we're going to walk through those. Um, I've already kind of covered what Amazon Web Services is. So we are the kind of cloud infrastructure provider. Uh, it, it, you know, that, and I use this statistic privately, but I'll say it publicly right now. More than 78% uh, of ed tech organizations globally run on the Amazon Web Services cloud. So, and that's really what's unique about AWS is unlike most businesses, when they start, they usually have competition after a few years, like one or two years. When, in 2006, when uh, our now CEO, Andy Jassy, started Amazon Web Services, it just started as a, a quick six-page document <laughs> that was uh, it being invested in, like, hey, we, you know, we have some extra um, you know, horsepower here. We could actually rent out servers and data warehouses uh, for use by other companies. It wasn't until six years later that we finally had competition. So not just one or two year head start, but a six year head start. And that's why the market share is so drastically um, lopsided in regards to Amazon Web Services being the leader in cloud infrastructure. So a lot of corporations that you may know, DoorDash and 
uh, Peloton and Disney Plus and Netflix and um, all sorts, of course, Amazon Prime Video runs on our, uh, so there's the, the, uh, so many organizations um, and of course learning management systems run on AWS. So uh, we hit that. EdStart is our startup accelerator for EdTech startup organizations, right? And so it's not just about, we, we want you to come and start your company using uh, Amazon Web Services, but we want to help you actually get to success, become profitable. And, and the ideal stage is kind of pre-series A. Uh, if you have been started in the last five years, we would want to talk to your, your infrastructure folks. We want you to start building using our Lego kits, right, and our Lego services. Um, we have uh, uh, 200 different services that can be leveraged uh, that can help you uh, build out um, your tools and solutions and sites better. And so we would want you, we also provide technical training and support uh, and access to a full global community. And it's really that community that has been, ha has a lot of folks excited. And we're going to walk through uh, some of those. So as you know, the pandemic changed sort of the educational environment. We saw schools, like li literally within a matter of, of, of a week or two, just all of the assessment organizations that do assessment within school districts and even higher ed just absolutely plummet. Like we, we have this unique view, right, of all the usage that's taking place. And we watched assessment organizations just go to the ground. And then vice versa, we saw, of course, all the distance learning apps just fly up. Anyone that was doing something that was online or virtual exploded in usage because suddenly ed tech became necessary, <laughs> suddenly it became essential. And so it was such an exciting time, but at the same time, all these organizations were like, holy cow, like my bill just went through the roof. <laughs> oh my goodness. Like we got to figure out what we're going to do here to survive. And so this became a very interesting you know, place for, for, you know, as a startup uh, organization, as many of our ed tech partners uh, figured out. So we've evolved. Uh, a lot of business models have evolved in the last year. Um, we'll walk through some of that. Um, and so I've already hit the head start. So these are the seven trends we're going to walk through. And I'd like to just kind of present a, a few success stories in each of these categories. So of course, online distance learning. You know, We're going to hit on, on some examples of, of scale and, and having to, to ramp up very fast. One of the unique things about AWS is you don't pay ahead of time. There's not this concept of, hey, how many reporting licenses do you need? You just pay for what you use, right? And this is one of the best parts about not having to buy a server and not having to buy a data, you know, stock a data center with different blades and different you know, CPUs. You just pay for what you use. And that is a huge advantage as a startup founder that you're only going to pay for what you, what you actually need. Uh, rapid innovation, like so just having to innovate faster, like if, I'm sure many startup founders have, have read the book, The Lean Startup, right? And, and that's sort of, in, in my world, that became like the Bible by which I build a startup company is iterate yourself to success. That is the theme of a startup entrepreneur is how am I going to iterate? How am I going to, to receive the feedback fast enough so that I can iterate my company and my, uh, my market to, uh, my business model to success? Market expansion, we've seen a huge growth in international and being able to go and deploy into China, India, um, in South America are all exploding right now with ed tech usage and, and um, uh, design in those education uh, 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 environments. So an ed tech startup company might want to say, hey, I can get into China and the K-12 market is exploding there. Help me get there faster. And AWS has programs that can help you do that. AI ML, this is <laughs> the biggest area of disruption that can come in the next two years is going to be in the AI ML front. And so using tools, and this is one of those 200, we have a bunch of different services uh, around you know, facial recognition technology and comprehend technology, being able to, to identify. Imagine uh, you know, how many exam papers can a professor <laughs> read in a week, right? About 20, 25 papers. Well, an artificial intelligence machine learning model can read hundreds of thousands of essays <laughs> in a matter of minutes. And so being able to use tooling like Amazon Comprehend is an ML tool that can read those and say, okay, I can tell that the sentiment that's being expressed in this essay is the following. And so it gives the professor, it gives the teacher an idea of what they can do. You know, grading becomes a lot faster, more streamlined and, and more logical. Um, accessibility and inclusion. So being able to identify dyslexia. Um, one of the things that's the bane of, of, of younger uh, teachers in, in, in elementary school, they have to listen to how a student is reading. Well, that takes the teacher away from the rest of the classroom, right? There might be 30 kids in your classroom. The teacher has to go each individual student and have them read a passage. Are they saying it right? Are they dictating it right? Machine learning is perfect for this. It can listen to how a child 
is, is speaking and be able to say, okay, this is working, this is not working, and be able to highlight yellow light, red light green light, red light, what a teacher, what, what a student is, uh, where they need to improve in regards to, to literacy. Social emotional learning, um, so it's not just about the grade anymore from the standpoint of you know, assessing, we want to understand that sort of these softer characteristics like grit, determination, you know, are being captured. And, and frankly, we've started to uh, lump online student safety into the world of social emotional learning. Uh, there's been a huge uptick in online safety. Um, if you watch the news, suicide ideation, right, is just at an absolute max right now. And so a lot of uh, organizations that run on AWS like Gaggle and Lightspeed and um, uh, Crisis Go and Go Guardian are all doing early detection for early warning detection for you know suicide ideation and being able to see you know can we you know detect early enough and fast enough you know what's happening there and then fundraising of course is a trend uh, we'll get into from the M and A and mergers and acquisitions that are taking place so that's just kind of the, the quick flyby so it's drilling into online and distance learning so unprecedented demand for global and online distance learning and the value of decentralized approaches has been one of the biggest uh, areas. So company like class to class where you think of a, a classroom being able to have a virtual um, portal into another classroom internationally. Class to class came online uh, and they're using uh, our Amazon Chime SDK and Amazon our AWS Elemental. So we have an entire portfolio of video engagement solutions that are real time, that are synchronous and asynchronous options as well. And being able to like take that, those video streaming assets. Uh, you may have heard, you know, Amazon acquired a, a company called Twitch, uh, and we took the the Twitch engine, which is so popular with gamers, right? Being able to watch gaming take place. And we, we productized that. And we took that, we call it Amazon Interactive Video Service. And so that is now being used for a lot of different organizations that just want to do webinars, just doing very lightweight. And again, pay as you go. Entrepreneurs are very excited about the concept of using IVS and, and, so, and the Chime SDK as well to kind of build out video engagement tools. Um, so Classic Class was able to go through, they made it a, an affordable platform for being able to have, take one classroom and, and portal it portal to the other classroom uh, and have live video streaming, online courses, they're offering tutoring, um, and, and it's, a, it's a pretty, it's a great um, success story of building on, on Amazon's uh, services, AWS services. Um, we have a, a, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these slides because we, we have a lot to get through, but um, you'll see different um, entrepreneurs or um, investors or um, uh, 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 accelerators that are in the One Valley is a, a big time accelerator. They've worked with our AWS Ed Start program in regards to the consultancy uh, and found it very valuable. So there, there'll be some plugs here, you know, in this deck uh, for for different um, accelerator, other accelerators that are partners. Rapid innovation. So we, the global education market is expected to surpass ten trillion dollars in the next ten years. Uh, and so you know, going from you could see sixty three percent of this it will be spent in pre K to K twelve uh, to twelfth grade. Uh, higher education <laughs> is is very much under attack. You know, it, it's actually the decentralization model is very real, and and what that means is no one wants to buy an album anymore. You just want to buy the song, right? It's the iTunes model, and so no one wants to buy an entire four-year degree program. They want to buy a specific set of skills that they're going to learn over a shorter period of time and for a shorter profit. And so the, if we can make that a credible, uh, an accredited you know, agency, the concept of composite degrees are actually becoming, I want to take Georgia Tech's computer science program, and I want to, you know, computer science 101, and I want to go and take a, a MOOC from Harvard, and I want to start stitching together these different courses, and I want to have a composite degree. Well, that becomes possible, right? And being able to innovate on that model. So this is why I'm suggesting that pre-K and K-12 are really the areas in the markets that we would want to go into. And as we've been having more uh, uh, executive conversations with a lot of our our larger ed techs, they see that trending as well. Uh, and so if I was starting an ed tech company, I would be, I hear like a feedback. Uh, did somebody say Alexa? <laughs> so, um, so we've been uh, advising if there's a new market to enter and you're starting an ed tech tomorrow, we highly you know, look at the K-12 market being, and even pre-K being in that, that area. Um, we have a, a company called Note who is able to take uh, handwritten notes and, and they're able to 
uh, uh, build a, a very, so it's like unstructured data and build quizzes and flashcards instantly, enabling users to shift, to take notes in class, to studying in seconds. So it's it's a very very cool. I've seen the demo of Note and how they how it works, and it's uh, they're using Q and A uh, chatbot to have human interactive engagement. Um, they're using uh, ECS, which is our compute. Um, our, our elastic container uh, service, uh, and then they're using SageMaker. SageMaker deserves some, some air time. It's our, you used to, to be an artificial intelligence guru, you needed to, to kind of have a degree <laughs> in computer science and machine learning. That's not the case anymore. You have, we have a do-it-yourself kit for machine learning, and that's called Amazon SageMaker. And so depending on where you're at in regards to um, uh, your knowledge of data science, we can actually help you get to a, a build your own machine learning models very, very, very quickly. Um, and so Note has been able to do that. They're able to look and transcribe text very quickly and, and build, uh, you know, build, build quizzes and flashcards uh, from that. So it's a very, very cool demo. I'd recommend checking them out. And they, of course, are an Ed Start customer. Um, we have, uh, again, like I said, several different, uh, three different CEOs here. Uh, starting, and, and it's a very uh, global presence. Ed Start's in, in Germany and Singapore. Um, and they have lots of great things to say. We have hundreds of EdStart members. Uh, and again, if you're starting an ed tech company, we would want you to join EdStart. No cost to start uh, to join. Uh, and we would want you to start building on our, our tool set you know, as soon as possible. Trend three is market expansion. So I was hitting on this earlier about just how many ed tech companies are wanting to, to jump straight into places like China and India, where we're seeing just massive growth in the education environment. Uh, and that shift uh, the founders have started to look at different demographics and target users, and, and, and we're starting to see where, where you can dive in you know, deeper. Workforce development is also a market that continues to be trending. When we think about working backwards from what the workforce needs, you know, we, we always run into this like, question of, here is 500 jobs in this city that are available, and here are 500 unemployed people. Like, what's it going to take <laughs> to get these 500 unemployed people into these 500 jobs, and like, what, what can we build to make that happen? And so there's uh, different markets that you can enter from a workforce standpoint, and, and we're, we're enabling um, uh, folks uh, to do that. Genially is a, 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 an organization that builds br um, uh, not slides, but presentations that are interactive for students in K-12, um, and they're able to use our, our storage, compute, and then the Amazon recognition, which is uh, our, fa it's our uh, object uh, AI service. So we can you know, see faces, it can detect sentiment analysis, it can look using a webcam and see if the, the kid is bored, <laughs> you know, or if they're excited, you know, and kind of actually do se true sentiment. Before they weren't using uh, Genially, before they just using us for storage and compute, um, but then started to invest more into our um, AI ML services and, and expand uh, more globally across uh, their set of 30, uh, they're adding 30,000 new users every single day and now serving more than 8 million users. So they went through our Ed Start program, we helped them kind of scale and build faster, um, and, and they've been a, a great success story. Um, uh, check them out. Um, and then I uh, won't go into a, another insight there. Uh, so AI ML, so we've already been kind of hitting on this and talking around it. Um, it ML is uh, no longer restricted to the tech giants, like I was saying. Academic researchers, it's available to anyone that has an interest with, with tools like Amazon, SageMaker. Um, being able to analyze and translate and transcribe audio and video and to deliver personalized content. This, this notion, back even when I was an investor myself in, at the Dell Foundation, this concept of personalized learning started to become like this very like overused term, and it was like, what is personalized learning? At the end of the day, like, what does it really mean? And at the end of the day, we, we saw companies, uh, even locally here, like Edmentum, you know, really start to hone in on how do we create an individualized education plan per, for every student, not just based on the fact that there might be some sort of um, uh, uh, characteristic that says, hey, this is someone that needs an IEP, but Everyone should have an IEP because everyone's going to learn differently than someone else. And so, how can we make personalized learning a reality? And the answer is through better AI ML, <laughs> being able to detect like what do students, how, what is the best way that Johnny and Susie are going to learn based on others, based on 50,000 other students like them. Like, what is the most likely to succeed? And in no way is this trying to replace a teacher. It's always going to be the teacher, but being able to aid a teacher in in in, in identifying a set of characteristics. That's perfect for what machine learning can do. And we started to see more teachers uh, accept a lot of the different uh, AI and ML tools 
that are being presented into the market today. Uh, always with resistance, like anyone can go and Google a headline and, <laughs> and find out like there's a lot of resistance when it comes to like, what is this tool actually doing? Um, and so Honorlock is an example of a company that has done uh, virtualized proctoring, student proctoring. And this is an example of kind of a polarizing discussion. And, and I'd be interested to hear if anyone, maybe in the Q&A session here in a moment, ha has some thoughts on this. But virtual proctoring, being able to see, you know, as, as the pandemic happened, we still needed to take proctored exams. But we weren't going to do that because of, obviously, the virus in a co-located area. So, you know, Honorlock was one of the first to market, and there have been many after Honorlock that have started to use the webcam and the microphone to see, is this room a secure room? Are there other people in the room? Is there a f cell phone in the room? You know, and being able to see, is this person basically cheating? Is there any reason to think this person is cheating as they're taking this proctored exam, right? And so they used a lot of our AI ML tools like Amazon Recognition uh, and others to basically detect if that's happening in the room. Now, again, like this is like a, a polarizing, you know, discussion because there's all sorts of different, uh, you know, um, factors that go into that model, and they're always improving. And this is a classic, like version one of something is never going to be as good as the, the, the later versions. But Honorlock has done an amazing job in regards to accelerating their migration and getting users comfortable, more comfortable. Um, and some other large assessment programs that I, I won't name have started to use a lot of what Honorlock is, is doing. Um, and so they've been able to scale successfully, uh, and they're continuing to. We talk, we talk with their teams regularly. Uh, they were a successful Ed Start member and grew their business uh, successfully. Uh, in their time, time with us. Accessibility and inclusion, so providing equal access to high quality learning opportunities and closing the digital divide with accessible technology is of course important. Uh, this, this stat just blows my mind every time I see it. The World Health Organization says that over a billion people around the world have some sort of, uh, of disability. And so this creates, like, if that's one eighth of the world's population has a disability, this is obviously something that we have to be building to. So speech to text and text to speech and everything in between, being able to comprehend different paragraphs, like I was saying earlier with the essay example. You know, having these different tools that can, can help with accessibility, dyslexia, and other tools, and being able to identify that faster, cheaper, and, 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 and present that as a teacher assist is, is huge. So Dom Lexia is a great example of a, an ed tech. Uh, their challenge was to determine how to provide materials to facilitate learning for those with dyslexia, dysgraphia, and uh, attention deficit, or ADHD. All right? And so they provide learning facilitation solutions for neurodiverse students in an integrated way. Um, and they use tools like API Gateway, SageMaker, Translate, and Poly. Amazon Poly is fantastic. In fact, many of you in this room may, and online, may have experienced Amazon Poly and you don't even know it because you might have been talking to a customer support person on the phone or even like a, a, an airline help desk and you think you're talking to a person and it, because it's designed that way. It's designed to actually sound like a human. That's what Amazon Poly is. And it was actually part of a, a beta program where they were uh, creating a teacher voice. Like, what is the most acceptable teacher voice out there? For whatever reason, a British accent was something that everyone really liked in regards to a teacher voice. I don't know why, but that seems to be like the, the predominant, like this should be the teacher voice. So um, Amazon Poly has been used for lots of different, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, human uh, linguistic uh, capabilities. Um, Learn Launch is one of our investors in the Boston area, um, and they are also, they have their own ed tech accelerator. Uh, Gene Hammond's actually a, a friend of mine, um, and they, they're doing some amazing things um, in regards to equitable access to education um, and, and doing some, some very uh, uh, smart investing uh, in helping with uh, startup, the, the startup uh, demographic. Social emotional learning is becoming more prevalent due to sharp rise in both awareness and recognition of holistic student wellness as a contributing factor to success. Um, so, and again, as I was saying earlier, SEL is, is all about that, those sort of soft skills, right? Um, I mentioned earlier my four daughters. So one of the things that I'm the most interested in uh, in the school environments that they are in is, is just having that sort of indicator from the teacher. How are they doing? Like, you know, are they, are they falling asleep in class? Are they bored? Or are they excited when they come to class? Do they have energy? Um, like, what is, uh, are they pursuing their work with enthusiasm? Are they, are they actually getting their work done? Um, it's these softer, you know, grit determination types of, of, of indicators um, that you kind of have to have a, a read on. As a parent, I always want to read on. Um, but I'd also say that we would lump the online student safety folks into as well. It's like, where is the mental health, right, of my child? Parents very, very much care about this. And, and we didn't include it in, in this specific startup guide, but I would say parent engagement has been a huge factor. Um, and there's been a rise in ed tech companies focused on parent, student, teacher engagement tools. 
uh, folks like Remind, um, Parent Square, and others uh, have been really uh, blazing some serious trails in regards to those communication uh, vehicles. Lesson B is, a, is an example of an EdTech that ran through our Ed Start program. They focus on reinventing health education in schools. Um, uh, they they, they um, made sure that their infrastructure was built on AWS, um, and, and it's a very um, SEL-focused, um, uh, uh, you know, mental health-focused uh, organization. Um, at first, they were only on AWS basic services, and they weren't uh, uh, integrated, but now they're using Amazon Poly and Amazon Transcribe to do more higher-level uh, computational pieces, and that's cheaper for them, ultimately, in regards to, to cost structure. Um, I'll skip through the EduLabs uh, Quote. And then finally, fundraising. So uh, everyone, this is one of the reasons that uh, so many ed techs are starting is frankly because we're going to see an unbelievable amount uh, in the billions uh, in venture capital that's flooding into the market. Um, and we're also seeing private equity interest. We're seeing several companies go IPO. Um, and this is all basically, be, uh, this is all because of the pandemic and what has taken place uh, in the market. Um, it's predicted that ed tech spend will increase by 2.4 billion in 2021, up from 35 to 38. Uh, globally. Um, where do you go to get uh, fundraising? So, you know, philanthropic grants, uh, friends and family, angel investors, VC, and it all depends on what you want to do. And a lot of folks are like, well, I'm looking for an exit in five years. Well, that's good. Like, that's one way. Some are wanting to create a lifestyle business, right? And so it really comes back to, like, what are the, the founder's objectives? We'd love to have that conversation with you. And we'd love to have, talk to, uh, put you in touch with our Ed Start program in regards to mentorship um, and coaching. Um, and so uh, we can help you with trying to find uh, different areas to, to capitalize your, your startup organization. So uh, Ed Start is obviously a program that we'd say, hey, jump right in. We have a training and certification team uh, as well. We have an, a, for those who are kind of further along in their journey, we have an AWS partner network, uh, which is a, kind of the sell-through strategy saying, hey, we can watch for, we can give you capture support, marketing development funds. Um, in, in other resources to help kind of grow. We'll do webinars with you. Um, I've actually hosted a few webinars with some of our ed tech uh, organizations, um, and that's been uh, fun. Uh, I, I like doing those panels more than I like doing <laughs> standing up in front of someone just talking for 30 minutes. Um, the marketplace is a, a way to kind of scale your, your tool. You can sell through our AWS marketplace. Um, uh, AWS events and webinars I already mentioned. Um, AWS IQ is an area where can, you can actually get freelancers that know AWS very well to kind of work with you as you're sort of building out your, your tech. And so if you're you know, one to five years old, we definitely want to help you and we want to get, get plugged in. Um, so uh, thanks. Uh, we have the, the EdTech Startup Guide. I'd love to open it up for questions. And, and frankly, I'd love to just hear from those in the audience or online if there's any questions that, that are, are happening. Like, wh where, where are you seeing other trends that we may have not addressed in regards to the pandemic, specifically in the EdTech landscape? Or, you know, what, what are you seeing? Because we, we see sort of this interesting, you know, infrastructure perspective and in what's hitting. Um, and, and I do kind of go on road shows every once in a while and talk with different leaders uh, of a lot of the larger companies, mid mid-tier companies and then the territory, uh, kind of the, the smaller startup community. But we'd love to hear from those in the room, like what are the trends you're seeing, you know, in the ed tech space, like based on the pandemic? And if there's any questions for me, you're, you're monitoring. Yeah. Okay. Yes? I'd say one of the trends that I'm seeing is just this, I would I don't know if the right word is awareness, but this digital divide that exists, right? Mm -hmm. Especially we look at maybe rural communities or even, um, you know, historically excluded um, communities within the city. And that's really been something that we've been running into a lot of issues with is, is that we're talking about accessibility, but also accessibility to technology. Um, if we're looking at more and more things being cloud-based, how we can be assisting those youth. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we've started to develop more intentional relationships with, you know, um, partners that like, like Cisco, right, where we're trying to get in, like we're trying to get devices and accessible to every area. Like it, Metro, it doesn't matter. That, that's an equity play. In, in our opinion, frankly, it's fundamental to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, it, it, so just personally, I, I have a double bottom line approach in regards to how I think through kind of the investments that we're making. And, and that comes because I, I was, 
more, I'm in this for more than just the, 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 the ROI from the standpoint of capital, but also the return on impact. I'm like, how are we actually affecting the sector as a, a giant, you know, big tech organization? And this is why the public sector is where I love to work. And this is why I'm trying to take these ed tech companies. Typically, ed tech founders are, are folks that are all in this for an altruistic motive. <laughs> and they don't want that double bottom line impact. And so then the question is, like, how do we help streamline the accessibility of all of these tools. Well, that's going to take more mob mob mobility. I point to my phone. Like more laptops, more Chromebooks, more everything needs to be set up in such a way that we have, uh, you know, satellite internet being beamed down into the most like under resourced areas that don't have internet capacity. And so we're making some big bets. And so I can't speak. I can speak to some of them, but I can't speak to all of them uh, in regards to the 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 bandwidth concern and and and, and as well as you know hardware and having accessible. Uh, accessibility to the tools. I think the government is actually doing a, uh, all the CARES funding and the stimulus funding that's being pumped in through the state education agencies is actually helping a lot. Um, I, high K-12, again, is being impacted more so than higher ed in that regard. Uh, but I see so much opportunity. <laughs> I think 10 years from now, we will look back at this and go, well, you always complained about not having enough funding, right? What did you do with it? <laughs> like, where did the $9 billion go that we were basically pumping into the sector for this exact purpose? And we're seeing it happen. I mean, we're seeing more bandwidth. We're seeing more uh, accessibility take place. And so in, in more underserved, underprivileged areas, we're seeing, uh, um, uh, uh, we're seeing that, that, start to, that ratio, uh, that digital divide starting to close. And because I think of folks that have really raised an awareness on this, doing a, a really good job. I had friends at the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that have been doing a ton of work in this area of having um, that return on impact measure. And we are seeing uh, like a closing of that digital divide. And that's exactly what we need to be seeing, frankly, give, given the capital that's being pumped in. Great, great question and great thoughts. Yes? Yeah, um, you mentioned 63% uh, going to K-12. Here, you want to repeat it into the microphone for everyone. You mentioned 63% uh, going to pre-K and K-12. What about universities? You mentioned sort of the a la carte approach. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for universities? What does it mean for people providing services to universities? What are the trends there? Yeah, great, great question. So well, the universities in many cases are... Uh, more sophisticated in regards to how they think about their infrastructure. And so they've seen this. I, I specifically think of those with the, <laughs> the billion dollar endowments have the, the capital to say, hey, we need to get ahead of this curve. We need to be offering our own virtualized uh, environments. We need to decentralize our different offerings. And they are creating different business models. And they are trying to scale uh, in, in certain ways and, and retool how, how they are impacting teaching and learning for those. So we're seeing, um, uh, and, and I'm not, I don't I represent our higher education team, but we're seeing uh, this huge uptick in uh, video engagement tools like <laughs> that's saying, hey, you don't have to be here on campus. We need you to, you know, be taking this course. We've seen a, 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 a one trend is the, um, instead of being synchronous, in regards to, to learning, you need to be here at this specific time. There's an asynchronous approach, like we need you to take the following curriculum and respond, and here's your homework for the week, right? And so you can do it on your own timeline, and so sort of decoupling, like having to be in a specific place at a specific time, this sort of um, uh, asynchronous uh, approach versus synchronous. Um, we've seen the concept of micro-credentials continue to become a really, very, very real um, tool for, <laughs> I hate, I don't hate it, but it, the, the gamification of education, like how far, you know, I want to stack the following micro-credentials to prove that I know what I'm talking about in this specific area, right, or this specific expertise. And so being able to invest in those, and, and we're seeing more universities say, like, we need to take a micro-credential approach uh, for these different uh, programs. Um, so those are just a few areas that, that we're seeing more. And, and honestly, higher ed has always struggled to prove how much a degree program costs. They don't run very well as a business. And so there's been, been more business process modeling that has been pushed into the, the higher ed uh, ecosystem. So the concept of saying like, you know, how do you, you know, hire a faculty and staff member like more efficiently? <laughs> it's, it's not unique for the 2,000 universities that are in the country, right? That's, that's a very standardized business process. But being able to think through, well, that's part of the cost of, you know, developing this teaching and learning curriculum and, and even building new content and iterating on it. Um, 
Like, what is that real cost? Because we've seen, what have we seen with funding? Like, the cost of higher education has gone up and up and up, but there's no, it's still the same product, so why, <laughs> right? And so I think that's what's really, yeah, like the eyes are open, like we need to make this a more efficient, more um, optimized way of doing, you know, higher ed. And that's where there's a lot of, you know, um, tension, you know, in regards to how that, that those, uh, uh, those pieces all come together and, and a lot of consultancies are there to try and say, hey, even some of the big consultancies like Deloitte, McKinsey and others have like started to say, let's do this better, faster, cheaper uh, and help universities out. So anyway, that's, I'd say that goes. Other thoughts? And again, I don't wanna be like the authority here because I'd love to hear your thoughts in regards to like what's taking place uh, in the sector. And are there any ed tech companies that, you, that have crossed your, your plate <laughs> recently? Steve, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts either. Yeah, so even just here locally in Minnesota, the, the couple of companies that I am aware of that do kind of more the upskilling piece, even, even just in the Midwest, I know you and I have met with one of them in particular, but yep. um, that whole kind of breaking apart the big package of higher education and moving along that way is certainly something we're seeing from the startup side uh, of things. Uh, so that's certainly a trend that we're seeing. And, and just... Uh, like on the K-12 side, I don't know if you want to add anything to this, but just, just the use of tools to do more around learning styles, complete learning, learning with disability, mm -hmm. you know, thinking of the poly, the text-to-speech, so all those kind of things that some of our startups are using. Yep. Um, it really kind of enables that, and I think there's some great use cases and examples for that if you want to talk, yeah. you know, anything about that. Yeah, so we've had several... <laughs> Several of the larger assessment organizations were uh, focused, at, they, they were, had a problem statement around, they would hire voice actors to actually come in and read test questions to students. And it was like, well, how much does that cost <laughs> to bring in actual people, actual voice actors to kind of go through and read to visually impaired students? Again, Amazon Polly dropped that cost by 90% because it can do a natural language, you know, uh, uh, speech for a text-to-speech program. Um, and so they were able to very quickly rip out the voice actors that they don't need them, right? They can just use the artificial intelligence tools. Um, so that's one example. Um, we're, we're continuing to see a lot of the, the publishers that need help with sort of taking electronic textbooks and using machine learning models to, to if you're familiar with like learning standards like Common Core and um, Nat, uh, National Science Foundation, like being able to, to tag and extract metadata from physical textbooks so that you can then build different electronic learning objects. This is another example of like being able to, to, to dive in, use trans, Amazon Transcribe, Amazon Comprehend, Amazon Translate for international type use cases. And, and it, all of that can happen very quickly and, and take physical textbooks and then turn them into electronic learning objects, tag them, and so I now can say, I need to find some content on teaching a lesson on the moon, <laughs> right? And it can go through an open educational resource library, pull this all in, and I can see everything, physical textbooks, electronic textbooks, seminars, YouTube videos, physical images, and it's all tagged and it's all organized and, and I can see it all personalized. It's pretty, those are the kinds of tools that I see as the future for like what machine learning can be, you know, in, in the education uh, context. So all that to say, if, if, if that's uh, of interest, we definitely want to talk with you <laughs> in that regard too. Other trends, other thoughts? No, that's good. I have one more I can throw out. Go for, go for it. Just to expand on it. Um, and you did sort of touch on this earlier too, but just in terms of like the overall funding piece mm -hmm. and especially the mergers and acquisitions side, you know, we've seen a lot of companies buying other companies mainly in two ways that I've seen. A, going after a competitor that sort of expands their market share yep. or buying instead of building, you know, certain functionality. If you have any advice for this group or the people watching, like if they're in a startup and how that might impact how they think about things, 
um, yeah. you know, just to position themselves for that. Yeah. But the kind of the, the buy versus build and, you know, buying a competitor, two things really I think we've seen a lot of yeah. in the last year. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's it, 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 <laughs> we've never seen M&A activity like what is taking place in the last in the last year, especially in regards to the consolidation that's taking place. Um, just this week, just the last week, we saw one of the biggest student information system providers in higher ed, uh, Anthology, uh, acquired the largest learning management system platform, Blackboard. And so we're now seeing just this gargantuan like like business uh, like be consumed in, 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 together in, in, in the K-12 space, the biggest that everyone knows is PowerSchool. PowerSchool continues to acquire different learning analytics companies, assessment providers, um, and there's this very much of a, you know, if, if, if there's a niche that, that of, of data or analytics that, that they want to pull in, as you know, when you're acquiring a product or an entire solution set, you're going to have a lot of uh, questions about how do I integrate my data, right? <laughs> you think about even here locally, right, when, when Delta and Northwest Airlines were merging, right? It took years for that consolidation to take place from a standpoint of being able to merge my Northwest account with my Delta Sky Miles, right? And you think of the systems that had to be re-architected to be, you know, to, to comply. The same is true in education. And it's even worse because it might not even be in the same language. It might not be the same back end. You might have a different cloud infrastructure provider. There's just all sorts of different questions. So one of the easiest ways to, to build is to do it standard, right? To build on top of a, a preferred cloud platform, to build open, you know, from the standpoint of open architectures, open source, uh, that allows other community members to contribute. Um, and, and so if I'm, you know, coming, you know, if I'm, again, if I'm starting an ed tech and my hope is in three to five years to have an exit with a larger player, I'm going to build in a very open and integrate, in integratable way, right? I'm going to build on standards. I'm going to build with, you know, as, as easy as I can on, on tool sets and Legos that already are in the industry that have an impact. I'm not going to go buy a server, start my own like proprietary tool and my own using my own language and just start to build from that. That, that would be ridiculous because that doesn't make me easily acquirable. It doesn't make me someone that I can, I can, I'm attractive to investors. I'm just sort of on an island. So the way to be attractive to investors is to be easily integrated, um, to be able to consume. On the buying side, if I'm interested in acquiring an organization, I'm also looking at those who are the most optimized in regards to cost. If, if they have a lot of tech debt, I'm not interested <laughs> in, in using it. I heard one of my colleagues uh, say one time, it, it's, it's like in the education world, there's this like legacy. If you're a legacy player, you have like all this, this, this hidden tech debt. You don't, no one wants to deal with you. They, she called it the nursing home <laughs> for, for ed tech. Like you don't want to go into like the nursing home. Like you don't want to be that tool. You don't want to be that person, right? And so no one wants your, your terrible tech debt. You need to, to, to you know, uh, obviously uh, modernize and get onto something that's, that's uh, new. I, I would also say this, the uh, building serverless is, is, is a new, like relational databases, and again, I, I don't want to get like too technical here, but the way that everyone used to build was this sort of client server architecture, right? Where you install something like here, think of like Quicken onto your PC or your Mac, right? Like it's an application, it's, it's a heavy client, it's not a thin client, it's not in the browser, it's heavy. And, and, and you would have this client server model in, in regards to when you build. When you build for the cloud, there's no concept of like client server, right? It's all server. <laughs> it's all serverless and it's all microservices. And so you want to build very efficiently. Relational databases are not efficient, frankly, right? I got Oracle certified in 2005. <laughs> like, I, I, I was a relational database guy, but like that's not the future. The future is serverless. The future is everything done super fast, big data, and it, it just lightning fast. Like that's the way everyone wants to, to live. We do it with social all the time. We do it on our phones all the time. Why doesn't the education environment have more serverless application architectures? Like that just, it still doesn't exist because a lot of the legacy players are, are built on old proprietary platforms. This is why 
frankly, if I'm tipping you off here, ed tech is such a, a market to be disruptive in. <laughs> like I read an article just a few weeks ago saying the quickest way to make a billion dollars in the next five years, go start an ed tech company. <laughs> like it's just so, so lucrative right now and so many problems to solve um, if, if you can innovate fast enough and iterate yourself fast enough to success. So who wants to go start an ed tech with me? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Steve's like, I do, I do. Other thoughts, other questions? Yeah? You know, a lot of what we've been hearing about, though, in terms of bigger picture, not necessarily just what you were talking about today, but in terms of these larger fundings or these things, you know, they're not very curriculum or content focused, right? A lot of them are these larger platforms, but at the same time, what do you either see that potential or those trends within the classroom? Because we're doing a lot of stuff that makes it easier for, say, administrators or mm -hmm. teachers doing data or all of these things. But what about some of the stuff that the kids are interacting with hands-on? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the bits... The <laughs> It's one thing to have like a this old concept of like a learning management system, right? Of like, hey, here's the content you need to go learn this content. But then there's this whole, pedag I mean, pedagogy is is evolving, right? And and so I'm not a pedagogical expert by any means, <laughs> but I'm aware that the gamification of learning is very uh, is very real. And and even my my daughters are are totally inundated with it, and they're on ABC Mouse. Learn, uh, Zern, um, uh, Seesaw, uh, what's the math one, uh, ST Math. Uh, there's just so many different, uh, and even they're using Khan Academy too, like just watching the different videos and watching through. The sort of um, learning, in, it, learning is happening all the time, <laughs> and that's the bottom line. And so the easier, an ed, uh, the easier an ed tech entrepreneur can make their tool you know, more consumable, for, for a student, make it something that's fun. Like my daughter has my, my Fire tablet and you know, she comes home and she immediately jumps on the Zern because she loves working through the problems and it makes it fun and engaging. And, and that sort of user experience is everything. Like, and, and very small tweaks, as we all know, right? I mean, if you, anyone that's seen the, the documentary Social Dilemma knows how, like, how the, the, the type of AI ML models that are taking place can be used for advertising purposes. And, and it's, it's so surgical and so specific to you. Why can't we take those exact same principles and those exact same powers really and build machine learning models that are helping learn faster and consume faster? Like that to me is like the holy grail of ed tech is to have personalized learning at scale in such a way as to make it fun and engaging. And, and, and honestly, I mean, <laughs> my seventh grader is so much smarter than I was at seventh grade. Like it's, it blows my mind how much further along she is. And I credit a lot of that to how fast the education environment has been able to cater to bring in ed tech and different types of ed tech into the classroom in, in a meaningful way, in an intentional way, not just for advertising purpose, not just to sell some other app, but they're doing it in a way that says, I, I value your learning more than I value your wallet, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that's been encouraging to see um, it, what's taking place. Great, great questions, great thoughts. So uh, let's get a round of applause for Mike Bauer here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.